All right, so as usual, we're going to record this, and hopefully if it works, post it um, as soon as we can uh, today. Um, so the, you've got a lab final tomorrow, right? And then on Thursday, you have your lax lecture exam. Um, at this point in time, you have a pretty good idea of what uh, the format is for each one, right? So the the lab will be very similar to what the last lab was, right? And again, uh, our advice would be if you did well on the last one and you know prepare the same way you would for this one. And if you didn't do well, try to figure out how can you prepare a little differently and do better. Uh, the lecture exam is, um, I think we gave you 70 minutes if I remember right. Uh, there's 53 multiple choice questions um, and uh, there's five essays. Uh, I sent one of the essay questions the other day, right? So uh, you should have gotten that. Uh, we suggest that you write the answer to it uh, thoughtfully soon. And then literally when the exam starts, just cut and paste the answer in and you've got one of those five essay questions done. If I remember right, it's worth five points. So, um, you know, uh, that's a, probably a good way to prepare. So I guess the first thing is uh, questions. Um, so I read somewhere that the lab final was partially cumulative. Is that true of the lecture final too? Yeah, they're, they're both um, have a small cumulative portion. The lecture portion, um, the cumulative is, is uh, just a few, uh, which kind of just basic things on evolution, which we sort of did the second time anyway. Um, I believe, and the lab's got some, just some very basic laboratory questions that you should remember from being lab anyway, and I don't think they're, they're too complex. Um, uh, so uh, to be honest, I, my guess is if you've been paying attention the whole semester, uh, you should be able to answer those, those final type cumulative questions um, and really spend most of your time, not all your time studying the information um, that uh, we had in the last module for the lab and lecture. Yeah, so it's just that the, the, the only cumulative portion of lecture is evolution. And we sort of, it's not even really cumulative because we've already, we reintroduced evolution with the Hardy Weinberg, right? Um, so, uh, you know, just maybe go back, look at the evolution stuff you had from the first exam once, and then uh, you should be fine uh, for that. So the lab exam's got a couple things, you know, from the metric system, you know, parts of the microscope, stuff that should be really basic to a, a biology class, um, uh, you know, that you should be kind of familiar with. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe go back and, and review uh, those two labs, uh, but it doesn't have very many questions from it. And again, I think it's pretty, pretty basic knowledge. Um, and like always, right, it's um, uh, your you know, open note, open book, right? Those are the only two sources you can use. So just make sure you have um, that information, you know, available if you if you need to go and look it up. There was a question on codons and anti-codons. Um, don't know if you wanted me to take that one. Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to okay. look up. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to get, I, I do have uh, some of my PowerPoint files here, but um, let me just see if I can do it orally. And then if that isn't sufficient, I can try and pull up that um, PowerPoint to go over it in a little bit more detail. So DNA makes RNA makes protein is the flow of information. And the information in the DNA gets basically copied into the RNA. The RNA that is actually translated into protein is called mRNA or messenger RNA. And those triplets on the mRNA are called codons. So they actually have the code. But that code needs to be read. It needs to be interpreted. And so the molecule that does that is the tRNA, which is the transfer RNA. 
So the triplets on the mRNA, the codons, will be complementary to, they'll match in a sense, the triplets on the tRNA, which are called anticodons. So the tRNA that enters the ribosome is going to be the one that has the triplet on the anticodons that's complementary to the triplet that's in there on the, the mRNA codons. So that's how the information gets uh, moved from DNA to RNA to ultimately protein. Because remember, the tRNA brings in the appropriate amino acid uh, when it enters the, the ribosome. So don't know if that was sufficient or not. Um, if not, let me see if I can pull up the, uh, the PowerPoint on that. Correct. So let's say the codon was AAA. Remember, codons are going to be three letters long. Then the anticodon would be UUU, right? Because RNA, any type of RNA, whether it be mRNA or tRNA, does not have T, it just has the U's, right? Instead. So are we okay with the uh, additional questions on um, the central dogma, or do you want uh, more on that first before we move on and, and talk about the cardiovascular system? All right, so um, while Dr. G was talking, I grabbed the... Let's call see if I can figure out. So here's the screen share of the um, central dogma questions, right? Um, and I don't think we have time to do all of them. Um, so what uh, what part do you think we need to do? So I'm um, seeing a couple of questions here. The mRNA, after it's processed in the nucleus, will then exit the nucleus and go out and join with the ribosome. So the tRNA and the ribosome um, do their jobs out in the cytoplasm. So. All right. You want to scroll down to 31 and 36? There we go. Okay. So this chart here shows uh, DNA, mRNA, tRNA, and the amino acid. Now, you also need the codon chart, which is in your lab book and also in your textbook. So DNA has two strands, and that's why it's got two rows up at the top. And those two strands are going to be complementary to each other. So notice at the very top left, you have a T on one strand and A on the other. So based upon that, you can start to fill in some of the missing blanks there. Opposite the G would be a C, opposite the A would be a T, and so on. The third row down is the mRNA. So the mRNA is going to be determined by the DNA's template strand. So that A that you see in the first um, column of the mRNA must have been read using the T as the template strand on the DNA. So it's the top strand of the DNA that is the template strand. If it were the bottom strand, then the A would have coded for a U. So we know that the top strand of the DNA in this case is the template strand. So based upon that, you can fill in all of the letters in the first three spots, the first three columns, and the last three. Remember, the mRNA is going to be complementary to the template strand, and the tRNA will be complementary to the mRNA. 
once you've figured out the mRNA triplet, you then look on the codon chart to figure out the amino acid. So the middle three, nothing's given except for the amino acid. But the amino acid in this case is tryptophan, and there is only one codon that specifies tryptophan. Um, I don't have the codon chart in front of me. I don't recall what it is. I think it might be you. Somebody have it handy. Um, UGG. What is it? UGG. Thank you. So UGG. Now, that is the codon. Remember, the, that chart is a codon chart. So the UGG would go in the mRNA row. And if you know the mRNA, then you can figure out the template strand of the DNA, and then you can figure out the complementary strand. And if you know the mRNA, the tRNA has got to be complementary. So based upon the information given, you ought to be able to fill in all of the blanks on this chart. Now, question 32 says, if we mutated that T and made it a C, a cytosine, then the other strand would be, of course, a G, but then the codon would also change. So the codon would change, and then the anticodon would change, and then so would the amino acid. So you just need to make those changes based upon that uh, mutation that was given there. And then question 35, what base is not found in DNA? DNA does not have uracil and RNA does not have thymine. Looks like there was a question about the flow of blood in the cardiovascular system. I think you can yeah, okay. um, take that better than me. The uh, uh, flow of blood in the cardiovascular system, uh, you can start very general, right? Um, and this will apply to both, uh, I think, some of the stuff talked in lab and lecture. Um, obviously, uh, you know, the cardiovascular system is made up of, of three components, three important components. Um, and in fact, if you look at the name, it sort of breaks it down um, into two of them, right? So cardio is a scientific word for heart, right? Like cardiac, right? So cardio, heart. Uh, vascular is general name for vessels. Um, and then what's in the heart and the vessels are the blood. So the cardiovascular system has three components. And it's the heart that serves as the pump to push blood through the vessels. Um, so if you want to start in the uh, heart, we'll kind of go through the, the, the different places where blood is going to go. Um, since it's a circuit, as a matter of fact, the functional name for the cardiovascular system is called the circulatory system because blood circulates. Um, but you can start anywhere, but just by convention, most scientists start in the right atria, okay? So remember the atria are, when you look at the heart structurally, uh, the uh, top two chambers that receive blood from other parts of the body. So uh, by convention, typically, you know, when you look at a, a diagram, the uh, heart is facing you. So the right side would be as you look at it, the left side, although that's not always true. Uh, so the right atrium is the upper chamber, uh, and its uh, job is just to receive blood and then transfer it to the right ventricle. Uh, so from the right atrium, it goes through a valve, um, and that valve uh, is, like all valves in the cardiovascular system, to prevent the backflow of blood, right? Um, so uh, when we look at the... Uh, blood flow then from the right atrium to the right ventricle, uh, very short, small uh, distance in terms of the uh, action. So the right ventricle is not very large. It has a very, th sorry, the right atrium is not very large, has a very thin wall, and its job is to just, you know, hold blood and then transfer it to the uh, ventricle. As a matter of fact, two-thirds of the blood roughly 
transfer passively, um, where the right ventricle just has a slightly higher, pre sorry, the right atrium has a slightly higher pressure than the right ventricle. Um, when the right ventricle pumps, it pumps blood um, through the, what's called the pulmonary trunk, right? Because it's going to the lungs to pick up oxygen. So on the right side of the heart, there's a low oxygen. So there's a little section in the lab that kind of goes through that. Uh, low oxygen that goes through there. Um, that uh, pulmonary trunk splits to the left and right pulmonary arteries. And those arteries go to the lungs and eventually go to smaller and smaller vessels. Uh, in general, this is not true in every case in the cardiovascular system, but most cases, um, it follows this pattern where we go from an artery, um, which are very large, um, very elastic and very muscular, fairly muscular uh, structures, to what are called arterioles. Arterioles are smaller structures that have lots of muscle that dictate um, blood flow to some extent, right? So right now, I'm guessing... Um, most of us are just sitting at a desk or on the bed or outside, <coughs> excuse me, um, just kind of hanging out. Maybe you had breakfast, you're digesting breakfast. So a lot of your blood flow is going to your guts right now to process that food that you ate. But if for some reason you had to get up and run down the street, then you want to transfer blood from your guts to your muscles, right? To provide oxygen and go through that metabolism stuff that we talked about way back in the third week of school. So um, when we do that, uh, we're gonna need to uh, find uh, the blood flow to change. So let me see if I can find something really quick. Let me see if I can find the um, heart model. It might help a little bit on the heart stuff. I'm pretty sure what, there's one in lab. All right, so. All right, so you should be able to see the heart model. This one's just in lab, but all heart models are the same. So again, um, we're talking uh, just as a quick review with the model. Um, here is the right, where my cursor is, the right atrium. Here's that valve, right? It's called the tricuspid valve because it's got three cusps. Um, and then here's the right ventricle. The ventricle pass, passes through another valve. This is called the pulmonic valve or the pulmonary semilunar valve sometimes or just the pulmonary. Um, and then this is the big arrow right here. This is the pulmonary trunk. And then you can see the pulmonary arteries. So um, again, that'll eventually get to the lungs. But uh, what I was referring to in a second ago was the fact that the uh, general scheme of things are arteries and then arterioles. And arterioles then help uh, uh, provide resistance to blood flow which then allows us to dictate where blood needs to go. Um, so uh, we can control the, what's called the partition of blood flow to different areas of the body through the arterioles primarily. Um, and then from arterioles, we go to smaller blood vessels. You can't see in this figure right here, but uh, uh, you can see uh, uh, in the uh, video with the goldfish tail, uh, you can see very small vessels called capillaries. Capillaries are where we see the exchange of uh, uh, oxygen and CO2 and other materials and capillaries. And then from capillaries, we go to venules, which are small veins. Venules lead to larger structures called veins. Veins um, have a very high capacitance, meaning they store a lot of blood in the veins. Um, uh, and when we exercise an example, our veins actually become stiffer and return more blood flow to the heart. And then once we're in veins, right, uh, we can come back. And so uh, going specifically to the right side of the heart where the pulmonary uh, trunk is, which splits to the left and right pulmonary arteries, you can see up here in the corner here, 
and then that side. Those go to arterioles and then capillaries called pulmonary capillaries where we exchange oxygen. We pick up oxygen from the lungs, give CO2 to the lungs to breathe out. And then those go to venules and veins and eventually uh, from the pulmonary side, those empty to the left side of the heart, to the left atrium through the left and right pulmonary veins. So if you see- I got back in quicker than you did. So yeah. it's all yep. yours. Take, well, take, take it away with your cardiovascular. Well, hopefully uh, uh, we, we stay, we stay on um, for that. Uh, so as I say in that, um, just a, a quick review for the, the cardiovascular, uh, just from the, the general vessel. So we go from the heart to an artery, to an arterial, to a capillary, to a venial, to a vein, and then back to the heart. So that's the general pattern in terms of things. Now for the heart then, and looking at a little more detailed with the heart, we go from the, as a review again, the right atrium, to the right ventricle, to the pulmonary trunk, to the pulmonary arteries, to smaller arterioles and then get to the pulmonary capillaries where we exchange oxygen. We give oxygen from the lungs to the blood and then give off CO2 from the blood to the lungs. It just goes by diffusion through capillaries. Remember, they need to be really small walled so that it enhances diffusion. They're single cell um, uh, structures and they're the thinnest of the, uh, cell type, the, the simple squamous, uh, one layer of very squished cells basically. And then when it comes back, it goes to venules and then veins and eventually these two large veins on the left and right side called the pulmonary veins. Now, just as an aside, notice the right side of the heart is shown in blue and the left side of the heart are shown in red. The idea is when oxygen binds to hemoglobin, which is a pigment basically in a red blood cell, uh, it's found also in muscle, uh, similar structure, um, it basically turns red. And when oxygen is not bound to hemoglobin, it turns blue or what they call cyan. So um, you might've heard the term cyanosis as an example. Cyanosis means someone's blue because they're not getting oxygen to certain areas. Um, and so, uh, that's what you see here in terms of the, the, the color. Once we get back the pulmonary veins, that goes to the uh, left atrium uh, through a valve to the left ventricle. And then from the ventricle, it goes through a valve here, out the aorta, which is the largest artery in the body, right? It arches up and around. It's hard to see in this picture, but it does. And then there's a number of branches that come off the aorta that go to other parts of the body. Um, this drawing doesn't do it justice, but usually the left ventricle has the thickest, most uh, muscle because this is called the systemic circulation and it pumps to the systems. It pumps to the rest of the body, basically. So while the right side only pumps to the lungs, the left side pumps to everywhere else, including the lungs actually, um, as well. And so that's called the systemic circulation. And then once you're in the systemic circulation, right, the aorta is the largest artery in the body. And these branches are still arteries up here at the top, these three. Um, uh, and uh, as those branch eventually get to arterioles and then capillaries and then venules and then veins, when you get to veins, there are two large veins that empty back to the right atrium, uh, the superior vena cava on the top, superior means on top of basically, and inferior vena cava on the bottom. So um, in a nutshell, you go right, at right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries, the lungs, pulmonary veins, left atrium, left ventricle, aorta, right? arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and then back to the inferior and superior vena cava. And that's you know, a pretty good description of um, the circulation. All right, so um, 
I didn't get all the chat because uh, it all disappeared. So if I miss something, you know, you can reach out to it. But uh, yeah, so Rick answered that one for our need to breathe. So the, the, the question from the breath holding part of the lab was which um, drives ventilation? Is it the lack of oxygen or the need for CO2? And um, the experiments that you do from hyperventilating uh, hyperventilating gets rid of CO2, but doesn't change the oxygen. If we put on what's called a pulse oximeter on your fingertip, uh, you know, it's uh, sometimes called a pulse ox, right? That measures a percent of oxygen. As a matter of fact, those are pretty popular now with people worried about uh, getting COVID and having trouble breathing. Um, they've been very popular. As a matter of fact, they're hard to find now on like Amazon uh, because everybody wants one. Um, so, um, the uh, amount of oxygen you have in your blood right now, if we put a pulse oximeter on all of us, it would literally be 99% saturated, meaning our body's already carrying as much oxygen as it could. It's like you getting 99% on an exam, you really can't get much better, right? Um, you know, maybe an extra point, but for the most part, not much better. <laughs> so when we look at, um, the experiments, uh, that one doesn't change oxygen, but you get rid of CO2 and you see that you can hold your breath longer. Okay. And then the other experiment in lab uh, that we wanted you to look at was, or one of the other ones for breath holding was to rebreathe in a bag. When you rebreathe in a bag, you're rebreathing your CO2, but But your oxygen, why it goes down, doesn't go down sufficiently. It's sort of like, you know, going up into the mountains. And it's not until you get, you know, up above probably 3,000 feet where you have any detriment in breathing. And even then you can still breathe at, you know, for instance, Lake Tahoe level without a whole lot of problem. And so the percent saturation when you're breathing in a bag um, is still 99%. We have pulse oximeters, and I've done this lab in lab, where students have worn those pulse oximeters in all the experiments, and it doesn't change. It's still 99%, but the CO2 goes up significantly. And so what happens is that in the rebreathing of the bag, your breath holding time is significantly less. And so in both cases, oxygen didn't change. It's the same. And in the one case, when you had less CO2, breath holding time went up. And in the other case, when you had more CO2, breath holding time went down. So it's a pretty clear indication that CO2 drives respiration, um, not oxygen. And, and yeah, if you, oxygen gets pretty low, then that starts and enhances breathing a little bit, but it's not until it gets pretty low. And so that you know, is what the whole question was asking. So under normal circumstances for most people, it's CO2 that drives uh, ventilation and breathing. Um, so for the blood through the heart, uh, through the body in general, it's artery, arterial, capillary, venial, vein, back. There's a few exceptions to that rule, but in, in the vast majority of it, um, that's what we're looking at uh, for that. Your audio isn't working anymore, James. I don't know if you can hear us, but... Uh, All right, what about now? Yeah, now I got you. All right. I get, I get, a, I get a, my internet connection is unstable. So <laughs> basically artery, arterial, capillary, venial vein uh, would be the, the, the uh, through the body. Yeah, I'm doing the, uh, kind of keeping an eye on the chat while you're talking, so... Yeah. You do have a new question about measurement of blood pressure and why drugs make you drowsy like Dramamine. Um, for uh, blood pressure, uh, you need a blood pressure cuff, right? And scientifically, it's called a sphygmomanometer. Right? And you can see that in the lab if you want to look at it. Um, and we actually use what's called indirect blood pressure measurement. Um, but the idea is 
um, is you'll put a blood pressure cuff over a large artery. The most commonly used one is the brachial artery in the arm, right? So you always see that blood pressure taken there, although you can take it other places. Um, as an example, um, if you went into a dentist's office, probably they probably have an automatic blood pressure cuff that goes on your wrist. Um, and again, it's under the, the same principle. It's not quite as accurate, um, but um, basically uh, what we're doing is we're listening to blood flow. Um, when you, uh, if you put a stethoscope to your artery right now on your arm, right where your, you know, the crook of your elbow is on the inside, um, it's called the anti-cubital fossa if you took anatomy. Uh, that is uh, where a stethoscope is a listening device, right? And if you put it on your arm right now, you wouldn't hear anything because blood flow is flowing fairly freely um, and you can't hear that. It's called laminar flow and you just don't hear it very well on a stethoscope. Um, so what we would do in lab is we'd take a blood pressure cuff and put it on the upper part of your arm um, and then uh, pump it up. And when we pump it up, what's going to happen is eventually the pressure of the cuff will exceed the pressure of the artery. So the pressure of the artery, let's say, is 120 over 80. So 120 um, means that uh, the first number is what's called the systolic pressure. Systole is when the heart is contracting, okay? So during systole, I can share the screen here. Um, during systole, when the heart is contracting, uh, you can see that um, the blood is uh, occluded. It's dammed up because the pressure of the cuff right, is greater than the pressure of the artery. Uh, and so there's no blood flow. And since the stethoscope, remember, blood flow would go from the upper arm down to the lower arm, right? So arteries go away from the heart, so the blood flow would be going through. Now, the blood flow in the artery is what we call pulsatile. So it gets pushed through every time the heart beats. Uh, it continues flowing um, during that time because of the elasticity of the arteries, but uh, it's called pulsatile flow. And so what happens is when you block the cuff by occluding the artery with a higher pressure, blood flow stops. Since we're listening after that point, um, we are going to not hear anything on the stethoscope because there's no blood going through because it's occluded. So then you use the little bulb down here and you start to let the pressure out. So what happens is the cuff deflates. As the cuff deflates, the pressure of the cuff goes down. Eventually, cuff pressure will be less than the pressure of the artery itself. And so at 120, let's say the blood pressure was 120 over 80, at 120, right now the uh, arterial pressure is the same as cuff pressure. And the next beat, once the cuff pressure is slightly lower, blood spurts through, right? Because now, the arterial pressure is greater than the cuff pressure, so that pressure wins and it spurts through. So you hear that in the stethoscope. So the first sound you hear during the blood pressure measurement, which is this one right here, this B, right, is when blood's going through, okay? But that's only when the heart is pumping, when it's exerting the highest pressure, okay? When the pressure of the artery goes down during diastole, when the heart's relaxing, the pressure goes down some, um, the cuff pressure is still higher from that, so you won't, uh, you won't hear anything, okay, again. And so every time the heart beats, you'll hear a beat literally in the stethoscope. And that's when the cuff pressure is between systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. And so literally you'll hear a boom, 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 boom. And as the cuff pressure gets lower and lower, um, eventually when the cuff pressure gets below 80, now blood is flowing freely because in all cases, the cuff pressure is less than the systolic or diastolic, remember diastolic is relaxing, uh, diastolic pressure of the artery, so the sound goes completely away. So basically, you listen to the first sound, that's systolic, and the last sound, that's diastolic. And you know, in this case, it was 120, because we didn't hear anything above 120, and 80, because it was flowing freely after, one, uh, after 80. So that blood pressure would be 120 over 80. <clears throat> this figure kind of shows it a little differently. I think this one's probably better, where um, these are the sounds you hear, 
these little mountains that are filled in um, during the middle part. That's called pulse pressure. You don't have to know that, uh, but uh, you hear those individual beats. So that's how blood pressure works. Uh, we measure blood pressure to see if um, uh, is important in terms of uh, 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 health and uh, hypertension. High blood pressure is a very serious disease that uh, you know we see in our society. And, you know, and even in linked to uh, people with hypertension have a higher mortality rate, for instance, if they, uh, and for m most diseases, to be honest, but COVID in particular, um, there's some data that shows that uh, in terms of that. Um, for uh, the Dramamine, I'm not sure exactly how uh, 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 Dramamine works in terms of um, uh, the central nervous system. I don't think it has any direct effect on the heart, though. I, I'm pretty sure it affects the um, it affects the uh, part of the brain um, that is important for uh, basically motion, um, and so um, I think that it just uh, uh, makes you f more fatigued because affecting other parts of the brain as well. Uh, but um, I'm not exact, obviously not important for the exam, uh, but uh, just from you know everyday life, um, I, it does not it does not slow your heart rate though. Um, in terms of that. And so uh, it makes it drowsy from affecting other parts of the brain. Like most drugs have side effects. And so we're trying to affect one part of the brain. Uh, in this case, it's the uh, hypothalamus. Um, but um, I'm not sure uh, exactly what other parts of the brain it's also affecting that's making you uh, tired. Um, Uh, in in Raynaud's uh, uh, phenomenon or syndrome, um, there's a uh, constriction of the blood vessels is what's happening, right? And so, um, yeah, so the arterioles, especially in the extremities, especially in the arms, um, get constricted and you get a, a loss of blood flow uh, from that uh, in terms of that. Um, and so... Uh, that's what happens with that. And that's, uh, you know, not that common, but you can see it um, in terms of that. Um, but melatonin has nothing to do with blood. Um, I, I don't think, at least I have not seen Dramamine affecting melatonin production. Um, uh, certainly something that did, it might make you more fatigued, but probably not in terms of that. So uh, blood and melatonin is, is somewhat irrelevant as well. Um, so what else? Uh, when the diastolic pressure is low, that's actually a, 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 a good thing in, as long as you're what they call asymptomatic. Um, so just like high blood pressure is called hypertension, low blood pressure is called hypotension, hypo meaning, meaning too little. And actually from a statistical point of view, the lower your blood pressure is, as long as you don't have any symptoms. So we call that asymptomatic. You've seen that alert word a lot with the, again, the COVID stuff. Uh, because there seems to be a lot of um, asymptomatic carriers. And part of the problem is, at least from a scientific standpoint, is we're not testing enough people. So we don't know what that rate is. And it could be anywhere from, you know, doubling the number, most estimates are at least, to five or 10 times the amount of people. Um, so asymptomatic means you don't have any symptoms. So the symptoms of low blood pressure would be you can't get enough blood to your brain, especially when you are under stressful conditions. Um, so if you stand up quickly, as an example, you have a reflex that's called the baroreceptor reflex that pushes more blood up to your brain so that your brain gets enough oxygen. If you stand up quickly and you have low blood pressure, you may not be able to get enough blood to your brain. And as a consequence, you're going to faint and pass out. Passing out itself isn't that bad, but it's what you hit on the way down. And so, um, you know, it also happens in, in change of conditions. Like sometimes people jump in a, in a very hot or very cold shower can do that um, because it changes blood flow, especially a very warm shower uh, because it sends more blood flow to the skin. And um, that means there's less away from your brain. So people that have low blood pressure, right, typically know that and they don't stand up quickly as an example. Um, so, and that's the, lies, the, the lowest one um, in terms of that. Um, yeah, so if, if you don't get enough blood to the brain and it, you know, 
uh, gets in your lower extremities, um, then because uh, you only have so much blood volume, you have about five, five and a half liters of blood. Um, if it's not all going to your brain, then um, you know you can uh, uh, faint and pass out. And so low blood pressure usually uh, doesn't result in those symptoms. And typically, if it does, it's um, young, uh, fit women, to be honest, more often than not. Um, and so usually as you get older, um, blood pressure uh, increases uh, uh, significantly. Um, that's why we see so many cases of hypertension as we get older. Um, and so, and if you're looking at the chat, um, uh, when uh, it talks about syncope, it's not, it's called syncope. That's just a fancy scientific name for um, fainting. Yeah, so uh, high blood pressure is, uh, certainly tends to run in families. There's a genetic component to it. There's also a lifestyle component to it. Um, uh, there's, uh, you know, weight probably plays a role. Your diet probably plays a role. Your amount of exercise plays a role, but your genetics also play a role. And, you know, unfortunately for most of us, um, your best guess at what you'll be like when you're older is what your parents are like now. Um, and so um, if you have incidences of high blood pressure in your family, you should get it checked often. Uh, you should try to maintain an ideal body weight, a lot easier said than done. Uh, you should try to, you know, uh, exercise and, and that helps with that. Um, but, uh, you know, there's sometimes there's not much you can do about it. Um, and, uh, you know, it can be fairly easily controlled with drugs. We've got a lot of good drugs now that do it that have pretty low side effects. Um, but uh, it, it long-term hypertension uh, will cause a lot of a lot of problems. As a matter of fact, I was driving to pick up my wife coffee this morning and was listening to a commercial about high blood pressure and strokes. And so I, I've heard that a couple of times now uh, in terms of that. Um, in terms of uh, cardiovascular system, the high blood pressure, um, it does a couple of things. One, it makes your heart work harder um, at diastole. Okay. And, and if you ask um, a nurse or a doctor, um, you know, which is worse, right? Let's say we're going to say, okay, you're, we're going to make you hypertense. We're going to give you hypertension. What, uh, uh, what do you want? Do you want it to be in systole or diastole? And most doctors will tell you diastolic blood pressure is much worse than systolic blood pressure. And there's a couple of reasons for that. There's two major reasons. Um, and most of the time doctors and nurses don't really understand what those reasons are. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the reasons is at rest, especially about two thirds of the time, our heart spends resting in diastole and only about one third of the time it's systole. So if I said, uh, would you rather have you know hypertension one third of the time or two thirds of the time? You go well, one third of the time because it doesn't sound as bad. So that's one of the problems with with um, a, a, a diastolic pressure that's that's high. If you have a low diastolic pressure, it's not a huge deal as long as you can again get enough blood to your brain when you stand up quickly and do things quickly. Um, and most people don't have um, uh, that low hyper hypotension where, where that becomes an issue. Uh, the other reason why hypertension in diast di the diastolic region is so bad is your heart has to work harder to overcome the resting pressure. And what happens are a couple things, but one is that means your systolic pressure has to be higher, which then increases the pressure in your uh, arteries, which then increases the likelihood of having, it's called an aneurysm where, um, and that's about, 20% of strokes are due to these, these aneurysms that end up bursting. Um, and so the uh, walls of the arteries begin to separate and get blood in between them. And that creates some big problems, um, whether it impinges in the brain on part of the brain, or if it bursts, you know, you're probably going to die, uh, to be honest. Um, whereas, uh, uh, you know, the other problem is because your heart has to work harder, it has to get bigger. And as your heart gets enlarged, it becomes less of an effective pump, which ends up making it bigger, which makes it less of an effective pump. And, and it's called cardiomyopathy or heart failure is what they call it every day. And um, 
uh, when your heart has to work so hard, it's not a good pump. And then, uh, you know, that's how it's going to work. So uh, the lower your blood pressure, the better, as long as you don't have those symptoms, though. It's the bottom line for that. Did I answer the questions that people had on that? Anything else? All right, anything else for upcoming? Um, quick question. So if we end up having like too many questions after listening to the next three lectures that we have to do, um, do we just email? Yeah, or you know, you can call you if if you want to say I'll I'll we'll do a a one-on-one -on -one Zoom session if you want. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, anytime. And, and you know, I've done that for a couple students already um, where they've emailed me and say, I got a question. I want to talk about this or whatever. Um, yeah, absolutely. You can email me anytime. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, e e email me and, and, and remember to include Dr. G. And again, try not to email from Canvas. One of the problems with Canvas, you guys, you know, I know that um, not all of you are, are, familiar with Canvas because, you know, you're new to the school and system. Um, but one of the problems with Canvas is if you email, you know, uh, Dr. G and myself, I don't know, he got the email and he doesn't know I got the email. And so, and it's hard to respond and I can't respond to that response if I need to. So that creates a problem um, in terms of that. And, uh, you know, so just go to your regular email or you can go to the inside email from your email, regular email and emails both and it becomes a lot easier. I do have a question about your physiology class. What? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get with you. Okay. We'll, we'll talk. I, I already cut and pasted your thing and I was gonna email you, I saw it. Okay. Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, in terms of the mammalian diving reflex, um, all of the, the, the blood goes centrally, right? So your heart, your brain, your internal organs, and, and, and goes away from your extremities um, to protect those. Um, <clears throat> you can go a long time without oxygen to your muscle in your arm because it's got a really nice anaerobic me metabolism with it. But <clears throat> your brain, it's got maybe five minutes where it can go without oxygen. Your heart about 20 minutes before you have irreversible damage. So that small amount of oxygen that you have in the diving reflex goes to those internal organs, um, especially your heart and your brain, to maintain the high oxygen because those are the two most important things, right? Um, and it's activated when uh, your face hits water and the colder the water, the higher the activation is. And they've done a ton of studies of blowing cold air on people, putting people different parts of the body into it. And, it, and it's not as effective um, when uh, it's not face in the water and have the water cold. Uh, and it also more effective in younger people. So, uh, you know, most of you are much younger than uh, uh, myself. And so, <clears throat> If you uh, uh, and I both fell into a, a, a frozen lake and fell through the ice and drifted down to the bottom and they recovered us off of 20 minutes, you'd probably still be alive and they could recirculate your heart. Um, while uh, myself, maybe not. A uh, couple last year in, in uh, Colorado, there were a couple kids playing hockey and they hit the puck off to the side and some kids skated off and she, and she uh, ice was thin and she got, she fell in and she sank with all her hockey gear sank right down to the bottom. They didn't recover. I think she was 12. They didn't recover her for 35 minutes and they recovered her and she's fine. Totally fine. Uh, obviously, you know, she had a heart rate of like three or four and she had that diving reflex that allowed her to stay underwater without, without drowning. Um, so that, um, blood flowing when you get a, a, a head rush, right, is when you're, that, that baroreceptor reflex I talked about when you stand up quickly, is your heart speeds up um, to make sure that you're getting enough blood to your head. And so that's what you feel there um, when you stand up. It's that, it's that blood pressure uh, thing. Um, so when you stand up quickly, right, your, because of gravity, their blood flow shifts and goes to the bottom of your body, not all of it, but a significant portion of it. 
and to make up for the lack of blood to the brain as compensation of a reflex that tries to increase the amount of blood to your head. Sometimes that reflex is um, not as strong uh, in people that like do a lot of aerobic exercise. So if we were like a marathon runner or long distance cyclist, uh, you're not going to have that reflex as good because it gets blunted from all the exercise training you do. Uh, it also could be blunted for other reasons, but uh, uh, that, yeah, the, that, that increase back to the head is to make up for that lack of blood flow you initially saw. Because again, your brain doesn't do very well without oxygen, right? You only got a couple minutes before you have permanent irreversible damage. What else? Anything? All right. Um, you can still email us. If you really need to talk one-on-one, -on -one, you can do that. Um, for all of the lecture exams, um, remember that um, there is no handout for those. There is a guide for the lab quiz. It'll certainly help and, and, it'll, and it'll make you understand something. Um, so for the natural selection questions, right? Um, remember those, those, that series of videos you were supposed to watch? Um, we do not have any uh, uh, questions from the natural selection uh, ones, videos you watched. Uh, on the exam, but for the signs and signals, right, that you were supposed to watch, there are uh, questions on there, even though there wasn't a little quiz after, right? Um, so also, uh, Dr. G's uh, uh, thinking about um, the Hardy Weinberg, right, which involves a little math, not very really hard math, but if you have any questions uh, for that? Did I answer that for the exam key? I assumed you meant a guide. As always, the best guide is the master in biology, in my opinion. Um, obviously, the, the lectures and, and the other things, the, the textbook, but I think the master in biology is the, um, the, the key to, if, if you can do those questions without looking up anything, uh, you're probably well suited for doing the exam just fine. And if not, then you've got a little bit more studying to do. It's not much different than <clears throat> we saw before, right? So, yeah, and, and a number of you did really good um, on the last exam, right? So prepare the same way. Uh, many students think this one's one of the easier ones. Um, I think genetics, if, if you understand it, right, and you understand meiosis, like, you know, and I think uh, Dr. G did a pretty good job, you know, making sure you understood it. Um, you know, there are some, you know, a lot of really good scores on, on that. And so this one's kind of similar. If, if you put a little bit of time in, you, you should do really, really well uh, for that. And again, you can always email us or, you know, if you think it'll help just, you know, talking for a minute, we can do that as well. You should understand the, the lung volumes and capacities a little bit. Um, I think it, it helps. Um, but, uh, you know, I, so yeah, you probably should understand them. Um, you know, vital capacity is probably the most important one in terms of that, but, you know, there are, all the other ones are, are important for, for understanding, um, in terms of that. So inspiratory capacity, expiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, total lung capacity, uh, residual lung volume, all of those are probably important to kind of understand how they relate. Anything else? Just along those lines, it's always helped me to remember that volumes are um, just one thing and capacities 
are the sum of more than one volume. So inspiratory reserve volume is different from inspiratory reserve capacity. And again, those that concept was outlined in the lab, I believe. So yeah, there's actually a pretty decent graph that shows the various volumes and capacities in the lab manual. Yeah, maybe hand draw that graph and then you know work on writing in what those volumes and capacities are, like you know, kind of to, to replicate the one in the lab manual. That might help in terms of practice a little bit. But obviously, like sort of implied in that question is the stuff that we spend more time talking about in those labs are the things that are more important, but certainly everything is possible, right? And even that guide, right? There are certain things that you better make sure you know, those are the bullet points in the guide, but there are other things on the lab that aren't in the guide, so you need to kind of understand everything, but really concentrate on the important um, things. Let me share. So the difference between inspiratory reserve volume and inspiratory capacity is one is how much you can inhale after an inhale, and the other is how much you can inhale after an exhale. So it's the sum of two things. Yeah, I actually thought there was a, a Western call it in there, but we didn't include that. Yeah, so as, as always, you know, again, the, the lab book is not unimportant. Um, so make sure you have a lab book and, and using it, and that'll help. Anything else? I'm judging from the lack of activity, we're okay for right now. And again, you know, I, I think, you know, Dr. G just implied this, right? Um, if you're look, paying attention to the chat, uh, I think your, your main focus right now for the next, you know, 20, 23 hours is probably getting ready for the lab that's tomorrow, the lab exam, and then really focusing on the lecture exam. Uh, we tried not to have anything to do the Wednesday, um, so you can really, really focus uh, the next two days after you finish the lab quiz, uh, just to make sure you, you get that final good grade and get as many points as you can so um, that, uh, you know, you get the best grade you can in the class. Uh, so, you know, if you, ha if you have questions, you know, obviously about lecture um, tomorrow, the next day, or even today, anything today, you know, email us and we'll, we'll do our best to answer. And most of you, you know, probably, you know, seeing that we've generally answered them pretty quickly. Um, animal tissue looks at the different, um, just talking, I, I believe, about the lecture information that kind of goes over um, stuff at number it four. It just discusses the, uh, the four main types of tissue, tissue that animals have, yeah. epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous tissue. I'm not sure, was there a question there, Precious, other than what is it? I'm not sure I'm understanding what you're really asking. So there wasn't a full lecture on that, I guess, is what, because um, I'm, I'm guessing that Precious didn't see the animal tissue lecture, and, and there isn't one, that's why. Well, it's it's part of the... Part of the circulatory. circulatory yeah. yeah, exactly. It's the, it's the first part of that. Yeah, so you see that at the beginning of the circulatory to kind of introduce tissue in general, 
Um, uh, you saw it in a little bit in the cell diversity uh, lab as well, right? But uh, it's just at the beginning. So you can't find the lecture video on animal tissue because there is no individual lecture video on animal tissue. Anything else? All right, then I guess uh, I guess we're done for the, for today. So thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, we'll actually have two videos posted. Uh, when it kicked me out, it stopped the first one, and when I came back on, I started a second one. So I'll post both of them, or maybe I'll string them together. Um, and that middle part that I wasn't there of, I won't know because I didn't don't have video of that. But otherwise, we'll be okay. You're all welcome. Um, yeah. Bye, everybody. All right, uh, Madison. Um, I'll, I'll talk to you for a second. Um, uh, Madison wanted to know about physiology. So um, the problem with uh, physiology for you, Madison, is that you need a chemistry prerequisite and an anatomy prerequisite to take it. And you need a, a college anatomy. And I'm guessing you didn't have that. So while I would love to have you in the course, um, uh, you wouldn't be eligible because you don't have those. Even if you had a high school chemistry, that would count uh, potentially. Um, but the... Uh, uh, anatomy, you, you would need an anatomy college uh, course. Right. Do you have that? I'm guessing you don't. Okay. I was planning on taking it this upcoming like semester. Yeah, okay. Okay. But you are welcome in my physiology class when you have the prerequisites, absolutely. And if you can't get an email me, I will add you as an extra person. All right. Okay. That's, that's, that's the one thing you get for being in our uh, our uh, biology class is I always try to make sure even uh, even if I have to teach a little extra to make sure you get in. Okay. All right. So anybody else? All right, then I'm gonna um, say thank you. I didn't go off again and my internet stayed stable and I'm gonna call my internet company and see what's going on. <laughs> so, all right, actually I'm gonna have my wife do it, so. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, let us know if you got questions. And uh, even if you need another Zoom, I can do it. All right. So thanks and, and good luck tomorrow. Bye.